Thanks very much, Maeve. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, the last occasion I spoke in this room, there was a big podium just here. I was able to put my speech on the, uh, on the podium, uh, read it, uh, and then take, I think it was two or three questions uh, at the end. But Maeve tells me that this is more informal, that I have to uh, uh, try and remember the, <laughs> what, what I, the notes I wrote. <laughs> and uh, so, so uh, 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 bear with me with that. Um, the, the, the topic that you gave me, Maeve, was to, to talk about um, how the template of the Northern Ireland peace process can contribute to international uh, peace building. The troubles, as they were known, um, lasted really for 30 years. Uh, book ended, I suppose, by the start of the civil rights marches in 1968, um, and uh, then, I suppose, ending with the Good Friday Agreement uh, in, in 1998. And uh, in that 30-year period, uh, 3,600 people were killed, men, women, and children. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about figures and averages and that type of thing because every individual who was killed, person with their own individual story, family, friends, uh, a life uh, taken from them. Um, but for the purposes of what I want to, to talk about tonight, I, I, I need just to talk a little bit about the figures. Because uh, if you take the 30-year period, 3,600, it works out at about an average of something over 100 per year. And the reason that I'm giving that figure is that if, if you take that as a kind of a baseline, 100 casualties, 100 deaths per year. Over the last 12 months, there have been 41 different conflicts around the world where more than 100 people have been killed. Some of the best known conflicts in the world, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, like the conflict in Burma, Myanmar, uh, like the Colombian conflict that uh, I'm now working on, are actually at the bottom end of that league table. In 14 uh, of the 41, each of 14 is a 41, over 1,000 people have been killed. And in the worst four, Iran, or, sorry, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, the Boko Haram insurgency in, in Africa, and of course Syria, uh, over 10,000 people have been killed. In Syria alone, uh, more than 50,000 people uh, over a 12-month um, period. So looking around the world, uh, we're looking at a world at the moment which is quite riddled with, uh, with conflict. One of the things that struck me reading, as I'm sure many of you have been, you know, last year, this year, uh, about the start of the First World War, that period 100, 100 years ago, one of the things that struck me was how relatively peaceful the world was uh, in June of 1914, uh, just before the assassination in uh, Sarajevo, which of course sparked off the, the First World War and then the Second World War that, uh, that came, came after it. The other, um, I suppose, contrast between that First World War and now is the nature uh, of conflict. Uh, in the First World War, more than 90% of the casualties were soldiers. By the end of the Second World War, over 90% of the casualties were civilians. And now, not only are civilians the overwhelming majority of casualties in conflicts, they are in many respects uh, the cannon fodder uh, of the conflict themselves. The attack, for example, recently in Brussels, uh, attacks directly using civilians uh, as, uh, as weapons of war. So what we have uh, at the moment, I think, is, is a world which is uh, very badly affected by, by conflict, where I think that there is a very strong imperative, not just for the peoples of the countries um, who are affected by conflict itself, but for the international community as a whole to work on the urgent task of peacemaking uh, and peace building. And in that context, Northern Ireland is seen around the world 
as a rare example of a priest process that has actually worked. I'm struck when I travel to uh, Colombia about the numbers of times that uh, Northern Ireland is, is mentioned as an example of a peace process that actually succeeded. Uh, internationally, seen as um, a case where a very deep conflict was brought to a conclusion by negotiation, where the main perpetrators of that conflict were, you know, were got to work together uh, in government and the running of their, of their country. And to the outside world, at least, uh, Northern Ireland appears to be a place that is peaceful, that is prospering, uh, where people are having a better quality of life uh, and the relationship between Ireland and Britain is seen as, uh, as enormously improved. And therefore, the question is often then raised about what Northern Ireland or the example of Northern Ireland or the lessons of Northern Ireland can um, bring to, to peace building and to peacemaking uh, throughout the world. I'm reluctant to, to use the, the, the word template because Every conflict is different, uh, causes of conflicts are different, uh, the nature of the conflict, the circumstances are, are different. And therefore I don't think you can talk of a template that can be simply transferred from the circumstances of Northern Ireland to the circumstances of another conflict. But there, what there has been in Northern Ireland has been an experience of resolving conflict, which I think has um, certainly is a source of inspiration for those who want to see conflicts resolved. Uh, but it's also, I think, there are many lessons to be, to be learned from it. I see the Northern Ireland peace process as not something that began in August 1994 when the IRA declared their ceasefire and that ended on Good Friday in 1998 when the uh, peace <coughs> agreement was, uh, was signed. I see it much as a much longer process, uh, and probably longer than some people uh, re regard it. Um, I, I can identify six phases in it. I just want to talk about those kind of six, <coughs> six phases of where I think there's relevance for each of those phases for other conflicts, particularly for the ones that I'm, I'm working on in Colombia. The first phase is, is what I call the foundation phase. Um, and in a way, it had started before the first shot was ever fired uh, in the Troubles uh, in 1969. Um, and that, was the, the, uh, that is the foundation, I think, that is built from the fact that the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland, as people everywhere, uh, didn't want conflict in the first place. Uh, they wanted to live a peaceful life. The leaders and the organisers of the <coughs> civil rights movement in the late 60s and early 70s never wanted to see their demand for reforms in Northern Ireland degenerate into what became uh, a nasty sectarian uh, conflict um, defined very much by national identity and, uh, and, by, uh, and, and by religion. And one of the interesting, I think, um, factors in the whole Northern Ireland experience was throughout the entire period of the Troubles, the strong voices that were expressed at different stages and that mobilised at different stages to demand peace. Uh, in the, I remember in the early 70s, there was the, the, the peace movement, Maurice Corrigan and Betty Williams and Kieran McKeown, after uh, a number of children were killed by a, a car where somebody had been, uh, had been shot, a big mobilisation of people. The Congress of Trade Unions had a Better Life for All campaign, uh, the USI Peace Jobs Progress campaign. Uh, there were big mobilisations <coughs> of people demanding peace. Uh, following the uh, Warrington bombing, following the bombing in Enniskillen. Uh, there was the peace train movement in the late 80s, early, uh, early 90s. There were, there were different expressions, public expressions and mobilised expressions of citizens of the country who demanded peace. And that laid a foundation, created, if you like, a constituency uh, for peace which, on which the... Uh, the, the the peace agreement was resolved. And for example, when Sinn Féin began to develop their um, Armalite and ballot box strategy and began to move from the Armalite uh, to, to the ballot box, I think what they found was a constituency of people, their electoral support, were people who at the end of the day wanted the conflict to end and wanted a, a peaceful society. And I believe that that had a big influence in the shift in thinking which took place uh, throughout the, the 80s uh, and the 90s. 
that phase, if you like, that foundation phase exists in other countries. It exists, for example, in Colombia. There is a very much a, a big um, um, population uh, and a big constituency uh, for peace, and it does find political expression in the politics of the, of the country. There are places, of course, where it cannot find such expression. It's difficult, for example, to imagine that you could have a mobilization of people in Damascus uh, calling on ISIS and uh, Assad to, uh, to, to back off. So it doesn't necessarily exist elsewhere, but it was an important, I think, precondition for the peace process in Northern Ireland to, to get off the ground. The second phase that I identify is what's called the informal talks phase. This is where they're sounding out uh, informal contact between officials of government and, uh, in the case of Northern Ireland, the IRA and the loyalist paramilitary organisations. It went on for quite a long period of time. Even as far back as the early 70s, there were informal contacts between uh, officials of the British government and uh, the IRA to see if there was some way that could be got to bring the conflict uh, to an end. Over the decades of the conflict, there were continuing contacts between Irish officials and British officials between each other for a start. Uh, Irish diplomats working within Northern Ireland, sounding out opinion there and seeing what was uh, seeing what was possible. Uh, the work that was done by people like, for example, Father Alec Reid, who uh, brought together uh, uh, people in uh, in the church to, uh, <coughs> uh, to to sound out how they how they might be able to to move forward. The Hume Adams discussions in the um, in in the early in the early nineties, which laid the basis, and that is a, a very critical part of the building of peace, and because it, it is what actually gets the participants to the table in the first place. And that sometimes can be difficult, because by definition, very often, um, uh, guerrilla movements, revolutionary movements, have already rejected politics and talk uh, uh, for, um, for armed action. Mm -hmm. So getting them to come to the table means sometimes that they have to confront some of their own support base mm -hmm. who consider their leadership maybe going a bit soft, if they're uh, talking about uh, getting into negotiations with government. And similarly, there is the difficulty on the side of government about the whole argument about talking to terrorists uh, in, in the first place. So that informal discussion is very important. There was um, uh, quite a degree of informal discussion in the case of, of Colombia. Some of it was brokered by the uh, governments of Norway and Cuba, who uh, managed to, to get some of the participants uh, talking informally to each other. Uh, important stage to, first of all, to get the parties to the table, agree what the conditions are that get the parties to the table, and also agree the broad agenda that has to be, um, that has to be addressed. The third phase, then, is the formal negotiations themselves, and of course, in Northern Ireland, that was the period from 1994 to 98. Um, interestingly enough, the period of time in Colombia is about the same. It's a kind of a four, a four-year kind of spread. If, if if, as we hope, that there will be an agreement in Colombia this year, it will be four years since those talks began in, in, in 2012. I think the period of time is, is purely uh, coincidental, but there, are, there were things that happened in both sets of negotiations which I think are quite similar. Like, for example, the stop-start nature uh, of the talks, the breakdown of the talks, the breakdown, for example, of the IRA ceasefire in, uh, in, in 1990. Uh, six with the uh, uh, Canary, Canary Wharf uh, bombing and then some of the bombing in Manchester, for example, a bomb in a shopping centre on a Saturday morning. Um, uh, episodes like that which, which caused the talks to stall and they had to be got back on, uh, on track again. And I think there were two or three things I think that were uh, key in the Northern Ireland talks, which I think again I think are uh, reflected in the Colombian talks. First of all, I think, was the determination of the participants in the talks, that they were going to stick with it and persist with it, and if things broke down, get it back on, on track again. Secondly, I think, was the role of the, the mediators. In the case of Northern Ireland, uh, George Mitchell. Um, in the, the Colombian uh, mediating situation is somewhat different. There isn't a single mediator like George Mitchell chairing the talks. The, government, or the governments of Norway and uh, Cuba are facilitating the talks and acting as, as brokers, and they have people who, who work with uh, the participants in the talks, but they, they work very strongly when things break down uh, to get them back on track again, and then there is the support of the wider uh, international community that encourages them to, uh, to get, back to the, get back to the table. 
I suppose the critical element in, in getting an agreement is that the participants have to be willing to reach an agreement. They have to be willing to make the compromises uh, that are necessary. The principal commit participants in the case of Northern Ireland were the political parties in Northern Ireland, including those uh, who had links and associations with paramilitary organisations. Um, the two governments, um, because of course in the case of Northern Ireland, and this is where I think it, it differs from the Columbia situation, uh, the Northern Ireland settlement involved in the three strands of talks, the internal formula for Northern Ireland itself, the relationships between North and South which had to be uh, worked through uh, between the two sovereign governments and of course the relationships between, between Britain and Ireland, all of which had to be uh, had to be knitted together. So the two governments played a, a key role uh, in, in, that, um, in that stage. You then reach the, um, the great moment, Good Friday Agreement um, in, in Ireland. Those who are old enough um, uh, to, to remember it will recall it was a big, big media moment, uh, a big occasion in, in Stormont when all of the participants were there. And, uh, I'm sure all of you have seen the, uh, uh, the film footage um, of that. And in many ways, that becomes the kind of the, the memory of the peace process. That is the peace. Um, that is the peace moment. Um, when will that happen in in Colombia? Uh, we hope it will happen this year. Um, I hope it will happen before the summer of uh, of, of this year. Uh, there was a target date which had been set, which was the twenty third of March. Um, uh, interestingly, it, and I, I don't think it has anything to do with the Northern Ireland peace process, but it was also Easter. It hasn't happened Easter weekend this year, uh, but it didn't happen. It came, you know, a lot of progress was made. I was in Havana uh, that week, an interesting week in Havana for other reasons, because of course it was also the visit of President Obama to Cuba. I started visiting Cuba on that, on that particular week. Uh, but as it happened, the, the final agreement wasn't concluded uh, on, on that date. There were issues that just couldn't be resolved by that, uh, by that time. Uh, but talks have resumed again. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, they will reach a conclusion at the, uh, uh, hope, hopefully by the summer. In a way, that's just the start of probably the, the more difficult part of, of the work, which is then the implementing, ratifying, implementing, and consolidating the, the peace. The first thing that has to be done is what do you do with the agreement? It's only a document. It has to be uh, those who have been involved in the conflict have to buy into it. In the case of Northern Ireland, it wasn't just a case of the uh, political leaders who were in. Uh, storm and negotiating it, who had to agree it. Uh, IRA members on the ground had to had to buy into it. Uh, uh, loyalist paramilitaries had to had to buy into it. And of course, there was also a requirement uh, that the public, because we live in a democracy, the people of uh, the country also had to approve it. And here, it was done by way of a referendum. There were three, I suppose, reasons for the holding of that referendum. The first was in the south. There was a constitutional requirement if we were going to change. Articles 2 and 3 of Bunrath uh, Neheran uh, to change the constitutional claim over Northern Ireland, which was expressed in those articles, to a, a more statement of an aspiration for unity. That could only be done by a referendum. The IRA needed it for ideological reasons because um, they justified uh, their campaign on the basis that uh, they were the inheritors of the last occasion, which was the election of the second Doyle, uh, that the Irish people had. Uh, made an act of self-determination as a total, that the Irish people as a whole had made this act of self-determination. This was an, a referendum north and south on the peace agreement was going to provide them with a new act of self-determination by the Irish people as a whole, which justified uh, them uh, abandoning the, uh, the campaign and, and uh, uh, giving up the, uh, the weapons. And of course, the third reason was to provide uh, political validation for the agreement so that from that point onwards, uh, anybody proposing to use uh, violence, uh, use the gun in pursuit of political objectives, were doing so in defiance of the wish of the Irish people, because now the wish of the Irish people has been expressed uh, in, in that referendum. President Santos, who um, has, um, as they used to say, taken a lot of risks for peace in Colombia, uh, wants a plebiscite to give popular approval or uh, public approval for the peace agreement when it is concluded in, in Colombia. That is not yet agreed, uh, first of all, at the negotiations themselves. And secondly, there is some political opposition within the country to the holding of a referendum, and particularly the kind of referendum that he is uh, he's proposing. Former President Uribe, in particular, uh, who has been an opponent uh, 
uh, although he was he, he was somebody who engaged in discussions kind of nearly when he was when he was president, he has actually been opposing the um, peace process uh, of President Santos, uh, and he's opposed to the holding of a ref uh, of a referendum. But uh, President Santos has made it clear that he intends to hold a referendum of a referendum. So, so if, for example, there is a conclusion to the Colombian talks by the summer. I would expect that there would be a referendum or plebiscite uh, in the uh, uh, in the autumn. The fifth phase then in, in the um, is is the implementation. Northern Ireland, um, Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland process has been successfully implemented, or most of it anyway, but very slowly. Um, and indeed, that is one of the I suppose uh, cautions that people elsewhere have when they look to the Northern Ireland experience uh, as a kind of precedent for their own peace process is the length of time that it has taken to implement. The institutions, for example, uh, which were established under the Good Friday Agreement, really the Assembly and Executive did not get to operate on a continuing basis until 2007. I mean, that in between times it has been uh, suspended on a number of occasions. There have been a lot of stop start in getting the institutions to start. And it really wasn't until 2007 when the DUP and Sinn Féin became the two largest uh, parties in the Assembly that it became uh, a more stable and, and has continued pretty well since then without interruption. The decommissioning of weapons didn't start until 2001, three years after the agreement. It wasn't completed until 2005, uh, seven years after the uh, agreement. Uh, similarly, the reform of uh, police, the devolution of policing functions to Northern Ireland uh, didn't, um, wasn't completed until 2010, 12 years uh, after the agreement. And issues relating to the past uh, and victims and their needs. Uh, only recently, uh, a formula has been agreed at the Storm and House, House Agreement in 2014 uh, to, deal, uh, to deal with that. In Colombia, the plan is to implement the agreement much more rapidly. And uh, to that end, um, the government has already established a dedicated ministry for post-conflict. Uh, uh, with a minister, Rafael Pardo, whom I've met on a number of occasions, um, and their job will be to coordinate the implementation of it. They have identified, Minister Pardo has identified, 18 priorities for uh, implementation once the agreement is signed. And it's really on the implementation that the European Union sees its role in supporting the, uh, the process and the agreement. And my function uh, is largely to support that implementation. One of the areas which uh, we've identified for early implementation is demining. Uh, Colombia is the second most mined country in the world, second only to Afghanistan. Large parts of the of the countryside have been, you know, uh, a lot of these kind of crude handmade mines have been planted in them. Uh, the European Union has already supported two pilot projects, uh, demining, where both FARC and, and the Colombian Army are working together on the demining project. I visited one of those on my last visit to Colombia in, in uh, NETA, uh, and it was interesting to see the, the FARC uh, commanders identify uh, the areas where the mines have been planted, uh, and then the army and FARC, with uh, international support, work together to try and get them uh, out, of, out of the ground. Um, it's a slow process, it's a very dangerous process, but it's, it's one that's very necessary. And I expect that the European Union will provide additional funding uh, to, um, uh, to, to support that. When Federica Mogherini appointed me as the EU Special Envoy for the Peace Process in Colombia, it was particularly to work uh, in support of implementation. And I've been out there on three occasions since November when I was appointed, uh, meeting with people at political level, at government level, but also meeting opposition leaders, meeting people in civil society, NGOs, um, and so on to try and get a very comprehensive picture of what needs to be done once the agreement is signed. The agreement itself, I expect, will be a very comprehensive agreement, much more comprehensive than the Northern Ireland uh, agreement, uh, ranging from rural development, political participation, how to deal with victims. And interestingly enough, in the case of Colombia, victims were involved in the actual negotiations themselves. Representatives of victims attended the negotiations and I think there is a much stronger sense of the needs of, uh, of victims in the Colombian Agreement than there was in the, uh, in the Northern Ireland Agreement. That, of course, will be necessary because the scale of the Colombian um, conflict is much larger than Northern Ireland. Um, 
over 50 years, um, 220,000 people have been killed. Uh, Six million people have been displaced uh, from their homes. It's on a massive uh, scale, and it will take quite a lot to implement it. European Union has decided to establish a trust fund um, to support implementation. Nine member states, including Ireland, have agreed so far to become part of that uh, trust fund. Uh, it will be important in providing support for the implementation. There will be other funds, like, for example, the uh, United Nations will have a trust fund, the United States uh, are putting in some funding. But at the end of the day, uh, the international money uh, will only be a small fraction of what is going to be required to implement it. The resources for implementation will largely have to be uh, Colombian resources. I think the importance of the international funding is not just the money, it's the statement that it makes. And we know, for example, from our own experience, that the International Fund for Ireland, for example, yes, the money was important and the projects that it supported were important, but even more important was the statement that the, that, that fund um, said to Ireland that there was international support, that it was expressed in practical terms, and that it was there not just financially, but also uh, politically as well. And that's part of what uh, we're doing uh, on the, on the, uh, the Colombian process. And then I suppose the final phase is the consolidation, which is really what's happening at the moment in Northern Ireland with elections again for a Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, it's still a work in progress. I don't think it can be taken for granted. There are risks to the Northern Ireland peace process, the continuing activity and presence of dissidents in, uh, in particular. The fact that Northern Ireland is still a very divided society, <coughs> with 50 peace walls in, um, in Belfast, for example, which you know, physically divided uh, communities on, uh, on sectarian uh, lines. So I don't think there's any, any grounds for, uh, for complacency and certainly none for a degree of self-congratulation. But it is, I think, an experience that uh, I think we can promote as a country. I think we can promote more, uh, particularly in addressing conflict situations abroad. And it's also, I think, an experience that sits well with the way in which um, Irish foreign policy has been pursued uh, down the decades. We have developed as a country a reputation uh, for the making of peace and for the building of peace, and the Northern Ireland experience is part of that. But it's not the only experience. The huge reputation, for example, that the Irish Defence Forces had in, uh, in peace missions uh, for the United Nations, in particular more recently, uh, European Union uh, training missions, the work that has been done by uh, NGOs and by development agencies, the aid work that has been that has been done, the work of Irish diplomacy and the reputation that it uh, that it has uh, throughout the world. It's evidence a couple of years ago, for example, the uh, overwhelming vote that Ireland got in the election for the UN uh, Human Rights Council, the kind of historic work that Ireland has done, going back work, for example, Frank Aiken on uh, the UN on. Uh, nuclear disarmament back to the 1950s to more recently the work that uh, David Donoghue, our ambassador in the United Nations, did on the, uh, uh, on the uh, sustainable uh, development goals uh, last year has given this country I think, a, very, a very strong uh, reputation in the area of, uh, of, uh, of peace building. And uh, it's therefore been a great, uh, great privilege for me to have been asked by Federica Mocherini to draw on that experience, to draw on the Irish experience of peace building, uh, to work on the, on the peace process on behalf of the European Union uh, in Colombia. Um, I want to express my thanks to my successor, Charlie Flanagan, uh, who has been very supportive to me in that role, and indeed to uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who have been enormously supportive uh, to the work that I'm, uh, that I'm doing.